What's up, guys? Okay, I'm really excited to announce that today's adult beverage supplier is Jing'e Brewery. Jing'e was founded in Beijing by longtime friends Chris and Alex. These two creative geniuses, with a shared passion for the fermented golden elixir of life that we call beer, are constantly hunting down rare ingredients and trying new ideas with which to create some of the best beers I have ever had. Jing'e is constantly pushing the envelope of what is possible with brewing, while at the same time celebrating its roots and changing the world's perception of Chinese beer. Let me tell you something, guys. Most people don't even realize that China, and Beijing in particular, has a vibrant and world-class craft brewing culture. But if you look just a little bit deeper, you will find that Beijing has an extremely vibrant craft brewing and taproom culture. Jing'e stands out as a leader in this field and has hands down created some of the best brews I have ever had no doubt about it. If you are in Beijing or ever get the chance to visit, I highly recommend you visit one of their tap rooms and partake of the golden magic juice that those wizards Chris and Alex create. You will not be disappointed. I'll put the links to their website and their other details in the listed show notes. Today, I'm having their signature American IPA called Flying Fist. Flying Fist is abundantly dry hopped, for a burst of tropical fruit, fresh pine, and zesty citrus, which smacks you in the mouth harder than a villain in a Shaw Brothers movie. This brew has won the bronze medal at the Asian Beer Cup in 2014 and 2015, and a bronze at the International Beer Cup in 2016. It's highly recommended. But as always, guys, remember, drink responsibly and abide by your local laws. Alrighty, some news for you guys. Uh, the Drunken Boxing Podcast, as you know, is a long-form podcast format. That means that podcasts can run as long as they need to, generally within the vicinity of two to three hours. So with that, I release one episode a month. And I do this deliberately to give you, the listener, the time to get through it. Not everybody has enough time to sit and listen to them in one sitting. So without piling up a backlog of podcasts that you might just seem uh, to get lost in, uh, I release one a month. The second reason for this uh, time frame that I release them is that I do not simply want to interview anybody. I try to select guests that have uh, knowledge, deep knowledge, experience, and something that is a little bit different to the average uh, person out there practicing these arts. So uh, guests are not always as uh, plentiful as uh, they could be otherwise. So with that, it takes time to get a quality guest, to arrange, to do this properly, etc. As you also know, I like to do these in person. Um, unfortunately, with the current situation, we cannot. So for the time being, I'm doing them by uh, internet call. But hopefully, once the world gets through this, we will get back to our in-person format, which is a lot more, I would say, personal. Anyway, that's that. Uh, in other news that's happening here, I'm sure everybody's heard about the challenge match that happened between Ma Bao Guo and a amateur Sanda kickboxer uh, a few days ago, which uh, ended very quickly where Ma Bao Guo ate a few punches. Now, me personally, I'd like to say a couple of things about this. Firstly, I don't think it needs the attention that it needs, but on the other hand, it does uh, for a couple of reasons. Ma Bao Guo is the exemplar of the unfortunate, deluded charlatan in Chinese martial arts. And I don't mean that uh, all of his teachings are fake or that, but I'm saying what he's presenting in terms of himself and his ability are indeed not true and misleading. Now, I don't know how much of it was an act. I don't know how much of it he actually believed. But over the years and within circles here, he's actually the he's known to be somewhat of a deluded person. I've always questioned his sanity the way he carries himself, the way that he acts, the way that he discusses things. its It seems to be that all of that only makes sense within his head. Uh, for me, the tragedy of all of this is that he's almost 70 years old. Uh, the fact that he got, uh, well, knocked out in such a tremendous fashion uh, at his age, even though his opponent was no spring chicken, he was 50-odd, as their report said, um, that that still does not take away from the fact that this was a highly dangerous, uh, highly dangerous and risky endeavor. And even for both parties, but also for the organizers. And I, I for me, I just cannot understand how somebody got uh, this arranged. There, there seemed to be no medical people on, on hand. Uh, the old man could, the way he fell over, stiff as a board, he could have smashed his head on the floor and, you know, what happens in that situation. So this is a... Uh, a very strange situation for me to look at as a martial artist. On the other side, 
you know, he kind of had it coming to him the way he was carrying on. He has a history of uh, challenging, misleading. He lied about a a video that he he filmed with an MMA uh, fighter from England called Irving. He misrepresented that. He 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 has a history of doing something with Xu Xiaodong. Uh, we can discuss in a probably with a guest in a later podcast. But you know, it's still tragic in all its fronts. Um. Anyway, I'm sure you've all heard about it. I wanted to share a couple of. Uh, my point of view, frankly speaking, I think, yes, it 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 doesn't, it, well, it's going to get the attention that it's going to get. But frankly, I, I didn't think too much of it because without the fight even happening, it's pretty obvious what the end result would have been with him and fighting with anybody, in, in, in fact. So what does this mean for Chinese martial arts? Well, I hope people can use this as an example, an example of how not to conduct yourself of how not to present the martial arts. But most importantly, well, practice. Practice in full. Identify where things are lacking and realize that you've got to improve all of these aspects. If we're a martial artists, if we are martial artists, then we need to be martial artists. Anyway, let's move along. Now, I've set up a Patreon account uh, just over a month or two ago. Um, and it's there so people that enjoy these podcasts and my other work that I present on the Mushin Martial Culture YouTube channel um, can support me in a way to enable me to, to continue. These are all done out of labors of love. Uh, they take a lot of time. They take a lot of energy. Um, they take a lot of skills, unfortunately. Language, cultural, etc. Martial, you name it. So anything that you can helps. If you can uh, assist through Patreon, it'll just help me continue to do this. If you enjoy the podcast on a monthly basis as it is, well, I need your support to be able to continue doing it. So take a look at that, and I appreciate anything that uh, you are able to do there. You can find uh, my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Mushin Martial Culture. That's one word. I'll put it in the show notes here. Okay, today's guest is Will Wayne Williams. Will hails from England and has lived in China for over a decade and has studied Taiji Mantis extensively with Zhou Zhendong in Yantai, Shandong province. He also lived in Shanghai. He is better known for his YouTube channel, Monkey Steals Peach, which is a travelogue where he has been showcasing Chinese martial arts from its source. Most recently, he has produced a few in-depth series on Shaolin Quan, Xing Yi Quan, and southern styles of Chinese martial arts. He is fluent in Chinese, has dedicated years of his life to the study of his chosen art of Taiji Tanglangquan, or Taiji Mantis, and is steeped in the culture. I've said this before, but people that make such sacrifices, leaving the comfort of their homes and exposing themselves to an alien culture in order to better study the Chinese martial arts are not commonplace. But it is this that gives one a true understanding of what these arts are in full. We had a great discussion regarding his journey, as well as other topics, and frankly, we could have talked for hours. So maybe we will do a follow-up in the future. So stay tuned. Anyway, let's get right into it. Here is Will Wayne Williams. Okay, welcome, Will. Good to have you on the Drunken Boxing Podcast. You're currently uh, in Australia, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Australia. Well, how did you end up there at this uh, time? So, uh, yeah, I was in China for about 12 years. And when you're in China for that long, it starts to kind of get to you. So I started to feel, like, okay, 12 years is enough, so it's time for something new. Uh, I didn't really feel like going back to Britain because I'd, I'd been away for so long. So I thought, yeah, Australia would be a pretty decent alternative. Oh, okay, okay. So you're actually, you, you're, you've moved there. I thought you were just there now during this crazy uh, epidemic situation. I thought maybe you left and decided to just go go stay there a bit while things calm down in the mainland. No, no, I'm, I'm doing a master's degree here. So I'm going to be here for at least two years. And then after that, it's kind of open. I'm not really sure yet. All right. Okay. Well, that's great. Okay. Well, we'll get into that then a, a, a little bit later down. Um, let's kind of start with, um, well, your beginnings. I mean, I, I first uh, got to know of you, obviously, through your YouTube presence, but I didn't actually find um, Monkey Steals Peach, your YouTube channel, first. I found some Jianghu videos that uh, 
uh, that were released that I think you were part of. And from there, I mean, that's how I got to know you. But maybe you want to give a little bit about your background, your history, um, etc. Anything you, you know, your story, where you come from, etc. All right. So I started with martial arts when I was about seven or eight years old. I did uh, karate and then taekwondo. And then when I was 14, I, cause I got into kung fu movies, so I started with Wing Chun, which was the only Chinese style I could find Where was in this? my area. In England, uh, oh, okay. in York. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I did, I did Wing Chun from the age of 14 to 18, and then when I was 18, that was 2007, I came to China. Um, initially, I was just backpacking. So I spent six months uh, backpacking through China, um, through Tibet, through Nepal, and to India. Oh, wow. And um, I did a little bit of martial arts during the time. Like I, I just found some people in the parks, and uh, this one Buddhist monk in a temple in Xi'an, I learned a little bit of Shaolin, Shaolin okay. Chan with, with him. But I barely spoke any Chinese at the time, so it, it was just kind of superficial. Um, but that kind of really changed my perspective on life, I guess, you know, coming mm. and, and seeing the other side of the world. So uh, I, after I went back to England, I, I felt pretty bored and kind of restless. So a year later, I moved out. In 2008, I found a job teaching English okay. uh, in Qingdao. In oh. which in Shandong province, so I, I moved out there, and yeah, one year turned to two, and I, I just kind of stayed. Okay, um, and, and it's that was what year again? Two thousand and eight. Two thousand and eight. I moved okay. to Qingdao. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah. Yes. So. Um, yeah. So. I actually initially I wanted to move to Guangdong because of my Wing Chun training. So, I, but I couldn't find any jobs or anything to do there. So it was just by chance I ended up in Shandong. I, I didn't know anything about uh, Mantis. I, I'd heard of it, but I, I yeah really didn't know anything about it. So mm -hmm. it was just chance that I ended up in Shandong, and then I found out oh the local style here is Mantis. So I, that's how I, I got into that just by pure chance. So you, you were actually quite keen on continuing your Wing Chun training that you had done for the for the four years previously in uh, in in England. Um, so obviously you were quite you were you were quite uh, well how how to say it? you 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 enjoy the style quite a lot. Is that fair to say? Uh, I did back then, but <clears throat> since starting Mantis, I found that for me personally, Northern styles. Are a much, I think they're a much better fit, and I, I, I feel in a way they're. I'm going to sound biased here, but I, th I think they're kind of more complete as well because they focus on the, the whole range of combat, and if you're also looking at, um, health aspects as well, I think they give you a much better workout. So for me, at least, mm. I got more into northern stuff. Um, but yeah, everybody's different. It's personal preference, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think Wing Chun is not uh, something that I would say can represent Southern styles on a whole because it is quite a specific art that had a specific aim and that's why its content is what it is. I mean, if you compare it to uh, Choi Lai Foot or uh, Hungar or something like that, the, you'll see it's a far more extensive system. So there's uh, uh, m multiple... I mean, variations of forms and, you know, content of bare hand content. There's a lot of, of that. There's multiple different weapons. There's all sorts of things in those styles. Whereas Wing Chun, it seemed to be a shorter, more sy well, simplified system with a specific goal in a, in a certain period of time. So um, you hadn't had any experience with any of the other southern styles uh, apart from Wing Chun in terms of your own training, did you, at that time? No, no, there, there wasn't very much mm. um, variety of styles where I was growing up in Yorkshire. Okay. Okay, so yeah, you ended up getting to uh, Shandong. So it seems like this was a good thing for you because, um, you know, you, you, you found a style that you you've, you enjoyed even more. Um, 
had you gone down to I don't know Foshan or somewhere down in in Guangdong, you probably would have sought out more Wing Chun, and and you you might not have found uh, something that well, it seems like you you found uh, personal benefit from with 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 the northern styles. So, so you, you, how did you end up getting into Mantis in Shandong? Um, well, I was I was teaching myself Chinese. Mm-hmm. And one way to practice was pretty much just going around the parks and just trying to, to talk to people in the mornings, you know, just going and seeing people that were training and, and, you know, just using very basic Chinese to ask them what they're doing and what style and and getting chatting. And um, I learned a little bit of Taiji. I, I got involved with some push hands people and I started to get into their circles. But then Pardon I found the that that wasn't really the, the what sorry pardon the pun you started to get into their circle sorry i'm just <laughs> yeah 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 um and that was that was kind of good but again it's very specialized and mm. it wasn't really for me and then i got a little bit frustrated trying to find what i felt was uh like a complete system of training mm. so in my frustration, I ended up going, uh, just looking at one of those big commercial uh, Shaolin schools, which was up in Yantai called Kun Yushan, you know, whether it's like a full-time training just for foreigners type thing. And I okay. spent a year there. Oh, okay. Um, it was actually, it, it was a pretty good experience, though, because when you're just doing martial arts all day, every day, you, you know, even if it is a bit superficial, you're still getting the basics down mm. uh you're doing sandar every afternoon you're sparring you're doing full contact sparring once a week you, you're doing a lot of hard training so you are really conditioning yourself yeah and it was it was there that i started to get into mantis because that was one of the uh, groups that you could train in right. so yeah I, I did a year of kind of quite basic level mantis there and then that gave me an appreciation for the arts, which then led me to uh, just stay on living in Yantai and to try to find out who were the top guys there in Mantis. And I, I went, there was, they basically have, you know, they have these lists. They probably have them in Beijing too, right? So they've got the uh, Yantai Shi Da Quan Shi, like the, the top 10 masters of Yantai. Yeah. So... <clears throat> I, I just I looked up the list online and then I, I tried to find where each of them were in Yantai and I went around and visited them all and it just so happened that the one that I got along with the most and I liked his style and his way of teaching was Zhou Zhendong who then became my teacher. Well, so you you went to I mean you originally went to Shandong you were there um, you you actually got employment there right. But then, yeah, teaching English. But then you transferred and decided to just go down the martial paths. You you weren't teaching when you originally went to uh, Yantai, were you? Or you you were studying in the school, or was it both? Well, I I quit the job in Qingdao. I had quite a bit of savings, so okay. I just took a year off, and I I spent a year living in the school in the mountains, which was just outside Yantai. Mm. And then I, after I left that, I signed up for a language course at the university in Yantai and then, you know, used that to get a visa and accommodation and whatever. And then, yeah, I just did private teaching and to okay. support myself and spent all my free time just, yeah, looking for, looking for a teacher. And then when I found him to train. What did your parents think of your choice to do this? I mean... Were they supportive? Did they think you're wasting time? Or did they just treat it like any anybody your age that has a gap year that just, okay, well, he wants to do that, you know, let him do that? Yeah, I guess <clears throat> just, yeah, they just regarded it as a gap year. And my mom sort of said to me that, okay, this is going to be like your equivalent of university. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess she, she never she never thought I would go to university. So she's like, okay, we'll have a year of full-time training and, and then go and do the language course. And, and yeah, she just sort of treated it like that. Okay. I, I remember I when I finished high school and I decided to go head, head, like head over heels into Chinese martial arts and I was living in the school similar to what you were doing and training all day and, and uh, you know... I, 
eventually my granddad i mean he's greek he's still got a heavy greek accent and mm. I, I remember him saying to me all right so what is your plan with this i'm like i don't know i just want to do kung fu and she's like kung, he's like kung fu what about kung, <laughs> kung food how will you feed yourself and eat and you know i know that a lot of a lot of parents probably think the same way but i mean it's good that that your your mom was easy going about it i i continued either way you know but uh you know, yeah. a lot of people. I, I think it was just a case that I was kind of a bit of like a, a lost teenager grow, growing up. And there wasn't really, I mean, it was, I grew up in a small town and, and there wasn't really a huge amount of opportunity. So, okay. yeah, I didn't really have any direction. And, and I think just the fact that I'd gone out to live in the other side of the world had a lot of intangible benefits. I mean, I was learning how another culture thinks. I was learning the language and you know looking back on it now i'm doing a master's degree in international relations and mm. i'm fluent in chinese and i i do know china really really well so it's definitely it's definitely paid off in the long run yeah for sure and i mean that's also something that uh, maybe your mom kind of knew that uh, china is internationally rising and it's going to be a benefit to know the language at least it'll give you a lot of different op opportunities in the future so that was a good thing either way i suppose yeah a, g a gamble at the same time i suppose yeah so you met your teacher and what style of mantis was that uh tai chi tang lang okay yeah and do you want to give so some just in case people are listening yeah, don't speak chinese tang lang is mantis well, go ahead and give some information about this Taiji mantis or Thai mantis because a lot of people think, oh, it's mantis mixed with Taiji, which it isn't. But anyway. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's a common uh, frustration I have when when talking to people online about about mantis, and that that myth is even perpetuated in the in the mantis world in the West as well. Mm. Um, but it's it's yeah, it's got nothing to do with Taiji Chen. So it's called Taiji just because of like the theory of yin and yang. Yeah. So you look at if and if you look at across most uh, classical northern styles, they have all of these particularly long fist styles. They have all of these key words which are kind of paired opposites, like Jin Tui, you know, advancing and retreating, Xu Shi, empty and full. Yeah. Um, Gang Ro, hard and soft. Chang Duan, long and short, yeah. and Qi Luo, rising and sinking. So it just it the style just puts a lot of emphasis on these pairings of opposites, both in the way you're moving and in the strategy of how you're fighting. Yeah, I mean that's a very good uh, overview because a lot of people don't realize that uh, Tai Chi Quan took its name because of this. Uh, philosophical idea but it's a pervasive idea in almost all chinese martial arts to a certain degree but in other cultural aspects and 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 philosophical aspects that affected day-to-day -day thinking as well i mean these the idea of opposites and interaction and the harmony between the two is probably one of the one of the key underlying uh, ideas within chinese culture itself so for us, we see a yin yang symbol. We immediately think martial arts, but for Chinese people, they see a yin yang symbol. They, they I mean, that's just part of their cultural, uh, you know, skeleton. To be honest, yeah, it's it's just the the world view that the people had that were uh, creating these systems of martial arts. It's, I suppose, it's it was the 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 science or the mathematics of of the day for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that's exactly it. And a lot of people also don't understand that uh, even today, when you look at somebody who's doing a sports activity or a physical activity, the culture from within which that activity uh, comes from and the general pervasive, not only worldview, but uh, medical understandings are always drawn into that uh, physical activity. I mean, most sports in the West would be explained with biological and biomechanical terms that come out of Western physical, you know, education, as opposed to 
uh, Chinese, for example. But at the time in China, with a lot, when a lot of these Chinese martial arts were being formed, that was the the physical science. That was science. That was the philosophy behind it. So they'd use those things to explain. And those ideas were absorbed into everything. And, and, and the same thing with culture, too. So it's it's quite difficult sometimes for Westerners to understand this. I mean, have you found that? I mean, with your interactions with Westerners? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, th I think it's it's like people try to sort of import these ideas um, in fragments into a kind of... Uh, western understanding of martial arts like they kind of pick and choose mm -hmm. so ra rather than rather than just kind of accepting that things like chinese medicine or yin yang theory were the way that people back then just explained the world they try to kind of put these on top of that they had they, they look at the martial art from a western through a western lens and then they try to pick these concepts like qi or jin or or e or you know whichever concepts yeah and they kind of put them on top of that and then mystify them and then as that gets perpetuated as one person teaches another they become these buzzwords which have completely lost the original context and the original meaning and yeah. they they just become kind of well they call it woo don't they yeah exactly they have become woo but I mean, it's very interesting because the one, I think the one buzzword in Chinese martial arts worldwide that has become the most Wu is Qi. And like, it's, the, I mean, most people are trying to define it as one thing, but it never was. I mean, if you read old texts, it never was a single thing. It, it actually was attributed to many things and many biological and psychological aspects and even natural aspects that they couldn't explain clearly back then was attributed or using this terminology that chi is uh, you know so nowadays if you say chi to somebody you think oh it's that magical energy that life force but that's only one part of what they were referring to at times you know and it it's just so yeah well they're, they're, i think they're trying to put it's like I said, they're looking at it from a Western lens. So if you look at Western languages, we 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 look at things as constants, right? So mm. like you're always being something, like you are fat, you are thin. Yeah. Whereas if you look at Chinese language, it's constructed in a sense of processes. So things tend to be more abstract. Like in Chinese, you don't say the person is fat. You say they're being fat, yeah yeah that's true that's true i guess that would also affect the psyche the psychological underlying psyche so if you, if you look at something like chi i think it's it's a case of it's a process it's not it's not like a a, a constant physical entity and i think that's where these misunderstandings come from yeah 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 for sure for sure. So, uh, what year was it that you met your mantis teacher? Getting back to to him. Uh, two thousand and nine. Two thousand and nine, and you've basically been studying with him ever since, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, I did bai shi, which is like the discipleship ceremony, yeah. after about three, three or four years after okay. training with him. And yeah, I've been been with him ever since. I stayed in Shandong until about 2015 and then i went to live in korea south korea for a year and then i came back to china to shanghai and then i did my undergraduate in chinese language in shanghai and then i would continue to in the holidays and any any time i got some time off i would go back to yantai and continue training okay would you say that the system is extensive i mean give give a bit of a overview of the system i think our particular uh, style of mantis, Heidi mantis. I think it's the most. It's got the smallest curriculum. It's the most kind of condensed, I'd say, because we only have the core forms. Whereas you see a lot of other styles of mantis that have lots and lots of forms because mm -hmm. they've created more forms or they've brought in forms from like long fist and other styles, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Taiji Mantis, it, it keeps quite, um, it adheres quite closely to 
the material written in the older manuscripts. Okay. And it's much, I'd say it's much more principle based than form based. As any good martial system should be. <laughs> mm. And and weapon wise, I mean, what are their speciality weapons? Does it have uh, standard weapons? Is it extensive in terms of weapons, more or more hand forms? Um, well, every yeah, ev so every branch has quite different weapons, and I think that's because in the early days, um, Mantis was just a hand style. And weapons were considered separate systems. Mm. So I think in more recent times, like look toward, looking towards the 20th century, um, as it as things started to get standardized with like Jing Wu and Guo Shu Guan and things like that, um, yeah, they started to absorb a lot more weapons. Uh, from, but I, they're pretty much all from outside sources. The only weapon really I'd say is pure Mantis is the double-handed sword, but that's still quite a modern creation, relatively speaking. That was created in the 1920s or 30s. Okay. That's a straight sword, correct? Yeah, yeah, just a larger straight sword. Well, I think the most famous proponent of the double-handed straight sword in China, and he's, I think a lot of Chinese martial artists in the West are starting to know him, is Yu Cheng Hui. Um, who... Yeah, yeah. Did he study at all any of these, uh, um, well, Taiji Mantis's uh, double-handed straight sword, or did he completely create something on his own? As far as I know, he his foundation was yeah in the, well, it was the it's not the Taiji Mantis that I do, it's the Hao family, which is slightly different. Mm -hmm. It's the Hao family that created the double-handed sword, and as far as I know, he studied it from them. And then I, th I think he was involved in modern Wushu. I think him and Yu, uh, Yu Hai were quite connected, yeah, if I'm right. So. Correct. And also because they were both in um, film. They were in the Shaolin yeah, Temple yeah. movies. and Yeah, Yeah, but Yu Hai, he's from Yantai. And he, he, his foundation is purely seven-star mantis. He's got a very strong traditional traditional background yeah yeah and he's got a very good lineage of seven star mantis as well yeah but of course he was employed in standardizing uh mantis for the well for the chinese wushu association for competitive purposes so i mean that becomes its whole thing a whole thing on its own um but i mean he's obviously the right person in terms of background and knowledge to compile such a thing the problem with that is and that standardization process and this the method or well, the way that the wushu organizations are well the organization and how they are managed in china is that it's not a bottom up it's a top down so he'd be utilized to create something but then what they do with it from there it's totally out of his hands and uh, that's yeah and you can see that when you look at you look at the old videos of him himself doing the form and you can see the traditional elements yeah I mean, okay, it's very jazzy and flashy, but you can see the way he moves, the way the movements are initiated, the way the the way he, as he kind of leaps, the way his body goes and his footwork and yeah. everything is really, really, he's very, very good. But you don't see anybody else that does uh, modern Wushu Mantis be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's... because they don't have that traditional foundation. Exactly, because what happened is it started to be looked at Chinese wushu is not the style is a form; it's not a system, and mm. uh, and we've had like I don't know four decades of that at least now, um, and the the further direction with regards to uh, just focusing on form competition and uh, old old coach old athletes becoming coaches and then their students becoming their athlete students becoming coaches there's no connection to that foundation and they haven't learned the system and they haven't developed the methods and the the body mechanics rooted within them they're just learning a form so it becomes mimicry and mimicry it's a copy of a copy of a copy as we're going down these generations yeah, yeah. and you can definitely see that looking at the early generation of wushu guys the ones that came from the cha and and whatever background the hua right. 
and back because the way they move i mean you'll know much more about that than me because i've not really looked at modern wushu but at least from what i've seen it is very very different yeah i mean that was one of the things i was trying to change in the last i would say eight years was that i i mean i was tired of the the direction and what was happening because it was it's a very clear direction and end result that will occur if we continue down this direction that you know at least from a first point of view i, I wanted to try shift the the content with regards to each of these routines and because we're not even we're not even at a point now where it's carbon copies of of a set routine made from somebody who has a traditional background now it's gone to the point that you create your own thing based on four generations of lack of knowledge and a a focus on uh gymnastic performance really so um you know i thought one of the key ways to start dealing with that is to at least start setting required content and if we can set required content that comes out of traditional martial arts as a step one that'll be one step in a in a better direction and then going from there it'll take a process of you know okay now you've got the content now it's about how the content is executed then how is it trained and then as time goes on it might might better itself but it was an uphill battle that i ended up just uh, just you know not getting anywhere with because like i said it's a top down approach and most of the people at the top the bureaucrats and and the and the well they're party members they're not they've got nothing to do with wushu i mean they go from one they go from one organization to another he, this he used to be a swimming in charge of the swimming organization now he's transferred to wushu and that guy was in ping pong and now he's here i mean it's the same it's it's the same it's like groundhog day every time there's a new person that comes in you know it's like, mm, mm. so that's why it's very hard yeah, to fix you, you see it you see it, it, it it's 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 in everything in china isn't it you yeah. see you see that same that same issue it's all about you know getting your mates into positions of authority yeah. i mean like when i was living in yantai there was quite a few times when i attended these martial art banquets and you'd have like the mayor and other government people there and you just look at them like how the hell are you working in government and running a city or or a province or whatever these people are just you know it's like <laughs> drunken slobs really aren't they? <laughs> yeah exactly they're just you know they're just all mates like patting each other's backs and gambaying and and clueless about what yeah. what they need to be not what they need to know they're clueless about the exact thing they need to know i mean to a and, and it's not as if they're trying to make, trying to, you know, fix that. They're not interested in learning about it, you know. So uh, it's really hard to get anywhere, exactly as you've said. I mean, they, they're focused on other <laughs> other things. Those are of prominence, uh, you know, paramount importance for them. So it's, yeah, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. And there's a total disconnect. And I'm sure your, I don't know your teacher himself, but there's a total disconnect between the official sports movement and the traditional practitioners. I mean there's no real overlap there i mean there it's in it's it's in name maybe but not really in reality yeah um i think in in yantai there's not so much modern wushu mm. i think mantis is the main thing and the the main martial art association is is made up primarily of mantis people but it's exactly as you say they're like the the heads of the association and the guys that are running things they're not necessarily the best practitioners or yeah. the you know the people of strongest lineage or, or the people with the most academic you know research mm -hmm. or knowledge or whatever it's just people that are smart businessmen and have got good connections yeah in beijing i mean it's very similar um the the traditional community is very strong they they have nothing to do with the official sport movement here. They they have a Beijing Wushu Association and a lot of them become members, but that's just okay. I'm a member. There's that's where the buck the buck stops right there. There's no further uh, benefit in terms of or interaction with the official sporting movement and themselves. It's just a matter of oh, okay. There a lot of them are you know registered in the Beijing. Wushu Association and under the Beijing Wushu Association I'm, I don't know if you know but they have like a, here in Beijing at least we have the the first single style martial arts association was set up by my teachers 
Bagua teacher, Li Ziming, and that was the the Beijing <clears throat> Bagua Zhang Research Association. And after that, some other ones started to be formed in different places. There's a Xinyi one and whatever. And I think in their initial stages, they did a lot of like Tuanjie, like getting people together, documenting who's <clears throat> who, getting them to interact to a certain degree, discuss, have theoretical discussions, etc. And just to try to build a community in both Xinyi and Bagua. But in in more recent times, it's become the same kind of just like hobnobbing you know you just want to be there to to take a photo and say that you're you're there and they don't actually do any of the research which is in their name to be honest so i don't know what is yeah the yeah it's exactly the same and you know you were saying about how like how it is in beijing where everybody joins the wushu association but doesn't really do anything yeah in shanghai pretty much every a traditional teacher you meet in the park or anywhere when they hand you their business card they've always got some really prominent position in the jingwu association okay. they're always some kind of like chairman of this or consultant of that or whatever of jingwu and it's pretty much yeah it's the same thing that it's weird because i went to the jingwu headquarters and um it, it doesn't seem to even really be active anymore they don't seem to really do anything except for collect these membership fees and and you know for people to have the name on their cards mm. they've um they've rented the original building that Ho Yunja used to teach in they've actually rented it out to an MMA club now jeez <laughs> and then and then upstairs they just have some offices uh like admin offices and then yeah they've got a couple of displays up about Ho Yunja's life and like a map where all the branch associations in the world are mm. and and everything but yeah it's the same kind of thing as what you were saying in Beijing well that's again i think and i mean because i was working within the official well the international official movements so i was dealing with the chinese groups here there's a very fundamental reason why that's that never flourishes um anywhere here uh Jingwu and all of these initiatives, when they started back then, they were initiatives, once again, start by the society that practiced, you know, they were from the practitioners, you know, making something or doing something and going up. And that's how it is outside of China, too, whenever you have these type of groups that want to do something like that, you know, they, it's from the practitioners themselves I mean, any federation or association outside of China is exactly that. It's a group of people that do that activity, getting together to formalize and, and do something further. But that's not allowed here. It's not really allowed here. So and even if it is and it occurs, it's not going to get anywhere in terms of it, it doesn't speak in an official capacity, if if that makes sense. So whereas overseas, if there's a large group of Chinese martial artists that take the initiative, unite, work together, create an association. When they've done all of those steps, they will get recognized by the government, etc. And then they will be the people in charge of that activity. That's not how it works here. So a lot of these people might have done such a thing, but it's a dead end because whoever's going to be in charge of it is whoever the government puts in charge of it. And that's it. So, you know, I mean... That's why I think these associations just become a, like you said, they just want to, you know, have a prominent name. It just becomes a, a title on a business card. It doesn't become anything more than that because they literally can't do anything more than that. Yeah, it, it, it's ironic as well because the Chinese government, they really want to in, increase their soft power globally. But it, it's kind of the, the way they're failing is that, like, if you look at, so this is a bit off topic. It's not about martial, art, mm. but martial arts, but I guess it's kind of still relevant. Yeah. If you look at like why American soft power is so successful, it is because it's kind of, like you say, a bottom-up thing. You know, creativity is encouraged. You know, filmmakers and, and music makers and whatever, they're, you know, it, it's people expressing themselves and creating things. And because they're allowed to criticize the government, criticize the system, um, it ends up being cool. Yeah. Whereas when you look at Chinese attempts at soft power, because it's this top down thing, it's, you know, somebody in an office sat in an office in Beijing has decided like, right, we, you know, we need to have something to compare to, uh, you know, American movies or, or whatever. And 
I've noticed that they they're trying to mimic K-pop now in yeah. China. Yeah. Um, but it, I guess it's just not taking off because it's it's yeah it, they're, they're they're approaching it completely wrongly. And I, you can see it with martial art. Like this is how I was going to link it back to martial arts. If you look at things like the Shaolin Temple and mm. Chen Village, but not as much, but more so Shaolin Temple and Wudang. It's kind of like they they've they're creating this <clears throat> they're creating this image of what you know what they think Western people want to see with martial arts. You know, pe- you know the fancy monk robes and the, the Wudang like Hanfu costumes, right? And you know, posing on a mountain and, and everything. But there's no real substance to it. So yeah, you might draw people in for a few months or a year, but you're not really because they're not really getting deep with the culture they're not really well it's not uh, natural it's not natural yeah yeah so there's nothing really to it and people just get bored and and go away and and end up with a overall i think end up with a negative impression of martial arts and i think that's why you see so much misconception as to what chinese martial arts are in sort of the common uh, perception like your average western person yeah well i mean that's quite interesting because like i mean it's it's again it's it's not related to to martial arts but it's it's the same model that's uh, applied to martial arts here but um in the west we have the majority of if you look at like uh, your best basketball players in the usa or your best football players in brazil and and south america they grow up playing that it's it's their it's their activity as kids that they enjoy they themselves want to play and they play it with you know with their full hearts because they enjoy it growing up and then it's an activity at school we have school teams and and kids are playing at school and then those that that are naturally gifted and work hard they excel and then it's a natural progression that goes out into the professional leagues and then of course once they become professional they have full time training etc from there on up but that foundation is already set as they're growing up now in China, the football, for example, you don't see school kids. Like, there's no, there's no leagues here. I mean, I grew up playing sport at school in leagues between primary school and high school league. We had, you know, a league within, uh, within whatever sport we're doing amongst the other schools. You don't really have that here, and you also don't really have kids playing things for fun. It's not like, uh, you know, th- I mean, it's a bit better now, but in general, it isn't. So when they say, okay, we need a national football team, they go around, they say, let's. The scout for some kids you've got good physical condition you you like football or oh, it doesn't matter you're going to play football you you look like you could be gymnastics so you go do gymnastics and and these kids that are take they're taken into a program and they're like forced to do it the same thing happened with wushu by the way um, my wife was a professional athlete growing up in the first and second generations and let me tell you they hate martial arts they, they don't really want to do it because they're forced to do it and then you know so it, it's not a it's not a thing of passion. It's a very unnatural thing. And it, it's, again, it's disconnected from society. So that's why it's, they're having, they have a tough time actually with you, if you've noticed it, with their sports movements here in China. I mean, mm, mm. I, I've said exactly the same thing about football as well. I've had this discussion with Chinese people about why their football is so bad. And I said exactly the same thing yeah. as you, that, that in the West, it's a passion and people, they grow up doing it and they think about it all the time and they love it. But in China, there, there isn't that culture and that's yeah. why you know, they're, they're not excelling. Yeah. So let's, I mean, let's get back onto martial arts, but yeah, that gives a bit, at least the listeners can get an idea of uh, some, some things that, um, that uh, exist here, but also how it's affected the global direction of the, the formal martial arts sport and why it has gone in that direction. But I mean, you and I are both more involved in the traditional, in the folk, which is very strong. And a lot of people don't know that. I know there's a, a lot of people in the West thinking that uh, all China, all Wushu in China is this silky stuff that they jump around in competition. Mm-hmm. But there's far more traditional practitioners in China than there are professional athletes. That's the truth. And um, they're, they're just carrying on, doing their thing, training as part of their daily life. Um, you know, so... I think it's just not really that accessible. 
Yeah. And I think that's why, I mean, like when I first came to China, yeah, it was very difficult to find good teachers. Like, okay, I could find people in the park. And, you know, like I said, I went around just talking to people in the park. But it took me quite a few years before I really found my own teacher, Zhou mm. Zhendong, before, you know, before I was really able to find somebody who was a proper lineage holder and had a, a good knowledge and, yeah. and, you know, a lifetime of experience. And it was, you know, talking to him compared to these other people that I'd met before was, was very, very different. Right. I think it's just without the introduction or without the knowledge of how to find these people, it can look like there aren't really martial arts in China. And then they do what you did because they think that, okay, there's this big professional academy up in the mountains. They think that that is it. And then they get there and you and I yeah. both know that those are superficial in for the most part. Yeah. They're, yeah. They're, they're not really teaching uh, deep traditional martial arts. They're actually catering to exactly that group of people that, uh, yeah. 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 So then they leave, you know, thinking that, okay, the, all the martial arts in China is non-existent and the ones that are being taught are just, you know, superficial nonsense. And But as you said, um, it's not that accessible and that is part of the problem. But I don't think Chinese martial arts ever was that accessible. It wasn't. I mean, we've got these ideas in our head that everybody was kung fu fighting, like the song says, but not everybody was kung fu fighting. I mean, it was... You know, you'd have to have had an introduction in the past. You have to have been probably from within the community. Otherwise, a teacher might not even look at you twice. And then you still had to prove yourself to him before he even started teaching you anything of value. So, I, you know, in that sense, it's that is how it is. Yeah. And everybody used to live in courtyards yeah. back then. They didn't have like the public parks like now. So right. I suppose, I mean, like when I went to Henan and Shanxi filming the interviews, you know, when you walk around the towns and the villages there, because they still have a lot of these courtyards, um, yeah, you just wouldn't know. Like, it was funny when we, we went to um, Taigu yeah. to visit the Song family and the Cho family. And as we were walking to the Song family's courtyard, you know, um, John was saying, like, could you imagine, like, in, unless, unless you, uh, you specifically knew where you were going, you'd have no idea. There's like, the head of one of the families of Xingyi is like living right here, like just the other side of this wall. Right. I mean, there's no, there's no sign on the door. There's no advert. It's just, you, you've got to know and you've got to be invited in. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why, I mean, a lot of Westerners, they, they're used to being able to go find a school. That's how they think martial arts is. You go to a school, there's a formal place of learning, you pay your tuition and he teaches you the stuff. And that's not how it was. As mm. it as you've said, it's it wasn't advertised yeah, and it yeah. wasn't it wasn't done for a living as well in a lot of cases. A lot of cases it was taught to um, groups of people that had a specific role within a community of defense or to get people to, to go into some form of uh, employment using those skills too. So it's we're looking at it in a totally incorrect way today, which is... Um, well, I mean, I guess in today's day and age, it's going to evolve and adapt too. And that's where you get all the charlatans or the, the opportunists taking advantage of that too. So it's a double-edged sword, I suppose. But it's, it's yeah, it's evolving. But at the same time, I think when we're looking at traditional stuff, it still really is a time capsule of mm. a bygone period. And I think one of the issues with... Um, when when people in the West are looking at Chinese martial arts is they're not always realizing the context uh, that Chinese martial arts like the environment or the, the yeah. context of, of how of how the martial arts were developed and why they were taught the way they were taught because you know society back then was very different right. and I think people right. people back then I mean there wasn't really like police and 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 you know rule of law and and stuff in the same way that we have now so i guess violence was much more a part of everyday life i mean even my teacher was telling me just in sort of pre-cultural revolution yentai like in the the early days of communist china he said that you know there were fights going on all the time and you had to be able to defend yourself yeah. like it was a kind of it was a given that 
men knew how to fight. So I think you can see this in the training methods that have been preserved, that when people went to learn Chinese martial arts in the past, this is just my opinion, mm. I don't know if I, I may be wrong here, but when people learned Chinese martial arts in the past, they came from a position of already being already knowing how to fight. And so it wasn't a case of a teacher being like, okay, here's some pads. This is how you punch. Okay. This is how you block. It mm. was, they were kind of giving them an edge. They were teaching them how to move better and they were teaching them principles that they could apply uh, and, and things like that. So I think, and I think that's got lost as time's gone on, mm. you know, nowadays your average middle class office worker who will go and train a Chinese martial art, they're still training in that same method of how it was being taught back then, but they're not coming from the same background. And I think that's where the disconnect is. Well, that's also you, a physical background. Right yeah, I mean, that that's a valid point. And also the, the basic physical condition was, I mean, a lot of people in rural China or Back in the day, they were, you know, it was labor intensive, whatever they were doing, physical labor intensive to a large degree. Uh, this is where that shift happens when, when we see Taiji come into Beijing. And that's a key point. Um, but Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good example there, comparing the Henan village like Chen and Zhaobao to, right. yeah, the stuff you say in Beijing, the Yang and the Wu and exactly Whatever. exactly because uh, you you weren't going to have a, a somebody come from from one of those physical you know intensive labor backgrounds that you got to say all right let's get your legs a little bit stronger because you can you can't even do three squats but that's how people are today you know so it's also you know it's 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 teaching from a different level as you say from step 1 it's it's, it's aimed at a different different level so how old is your teacher, if I may ask? Um, he's in his 60s. I'm going to have to think about this. Okay. He was born in, in 1953, so oh. I'm not very good at maths. I'll let you work that out. Yeah, he's in his late 60s. Okay, so... Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, he knows I mean, in a similar time, my teacher is slightly older than him. But yeah, my teacher told me the same thing. My teacher was born in Hebei and then moved to Beijing um, when he was, I think, around... Uh, seven or eight or something like that but he used to tell me that well back in the village areas you know getting attacked was a thing that could happen all the time and beijing as well and, and we're even talking about maybe even up until 30 years ago if you got 30 40 years ago you go in the wrong place at the wrong time of night there's a high chance that you're going to get whacked over the head with something and you know things are going to take get taken from you that was that was just a thing that you was was common so yeah i mean the the the, the society as you said was uh, most people were aware and and living within that type of an environment so, yeah definitely i mean in yentai it, going right up to the the late 90s i'd say you know from what people have told me yentai was still a pretty violent place well yeah yeah, it would be. I mean, Beijing would obviously, being the capital, um, crack down on that faster than other areas, for sure, for sure. So, what what is um, what is what is your training been like with within your Taiji Mantis system? I mean, is there a progression? Is there is there certain what is the content? What like I'll, I'll let me let me phrase it differently. I mean, in Xing Yitran, for example, we start with Santi Shi Zhan Zhuang and other. Zhang methods, then we start uh, moving on to five elements. But at, at every, it doesn't matter how long you've been in it, those foundational methods have to be done on a daily basis. And they include uh, an element of Zhang Zhuang. And then there's Nei Gong, which I would say is like moving Zhuang, but you know, specific skill building <clears throat> exercises. And then down to certain key methods that are the underlying body mechanics and uh, I would say in Xingyi, we'd say vectors that force and body mechanics that are existent mm. in everything. What is it like in, in Mantis? I think it's, it's a lot more eclectic than, than a style like Xingyi. Mm. Um, I mean, you, yeah, you typically start with doing your basic stretch kicks. Um, okay. And then from there you'll go on to do the basic stances uh there's 
there's eight basic stances so very similar to long fist type stuff mm -hmm. so you've got you've got eight basic stances um and then you'll do line drills you know punching in bow stance different kicks different uh strikes takedowns just you know very simple up and down in you know just practicing single techniques up and down in lines yeah and then from there you'll you'll usually start to do basic partner work before you start to learn forms so you'll do like the forearm conditioning okay and then we'll we'll actually start to introduce the basic applications mm. through doing the uh, forearm striking so again this is quite a, a long fist type thing mm. um and then we we uh, do like the mantis we practice the mantis hook so grabbing each other's wrist while studying gongbu uh, we do a little bit of i guess you could say a little bit like basic push hands type stuff but mm -hmm. it's a lot harder yeah uh, so we have all these partner drills and then from there we'll go into learning forms um there's no real order um i've seen my teacher teach all different forms to to, to people just depending on what what he f feels like i guess mm. maybe depends on his mood or if he you know if he think what, what what that person's uh body body style is or you know body type is or whatever i'm not, I'm not really sure how he decides that but right yeah there's no specific order to the forms learned does he have a lot of so, foreign students or were you were you one of his first foreign students um yeah, a, f a fair few but not i mean not loads in one go but over the years i think the first he had some japanese a couple of japanese people in the 90s okay uh and a couple of russians quite early on and then starting from the 2000s he's had um yeah a, a, a slow but steady stream of of foreigners but as as far as people that that s stick with it for a long time mm. there's probably five or six of us maximum okay. i'd say i've actually got a, a somebody i know he's russian um, and he lived in China for a long time, a long time ago as well. I mean, he's quite a long, an old hand here. And his thing was also Shandong Mantis. He was doing research. I can't recall which line of Mantis he did off the top of my head. Boris. No, not Boris. Not Boris. Oh, okay. His name is Ilya Profatilov or something like that. I... Oh, Ilya. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know him too. He's visited my teacher quite a few times okay. over the years. Yeah, so he was yeah. also deeply into Mantis. I don't know Boris. Maybe they know each other. But um, yeah, I know Ilya. Oh, because Boris lives in Beijing. That's why I thought you... Would... Boris lives in Beijing and he's also an old hand in Mantis. But he's now learning Tuojiao uh, in Beijing. I thought that's why I thought you might have known him. Oh, okay. Oh, he's doing Chuojiao. Yeah, well, this is a place to learn yeah. Chuojiao too, Chuojiao Fanzi. My teacher actually studied with yeah. Wu Binlo, um, but that was like his third art and he did it just additionally. He didn't, I mean, it's a big, it's a huge system. It's got a whole bunch of Chuojiao routines and it's got a whole bunch of Fanzi routines. It's a big system. He just did some uh, bits and pieces of it. Actually, he wanted to fill the gap with footwork, with kicking, uh, because, you know, Xing is not very much a... Uh, a kicking art and Bagua has hidden kicks but he wanted to learn some of Chojiao's methods and uh, he's... yeah I'd be interested to learn a little bit because you know Chojiao used to be called Yuan Yang Zhao yes. right, back in the day and and that's one of the uh, like building blocks of Mantis as far as elements of our footwork and kicking so I'd be quite interested to learn a little bit of you know just its basics yeah just to explore that connection. You know, I did. I did. An, I had. A, I had an extensive long fist background before I started training with my teacher in Xing Yi Quan. So, uh, and I wanted to learn Xing Yi and Bagua, and his core styles are Xing Yi and Bagua. I had no interest. Mm. I had no interest to learn Chuojiao from him. But I have. Well, you've probably done tons of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I have, and I saw him teaching at times some of the students some of the guys that did chuojiao with him and i mean he's skilled he's very skilled at it too but definitely his mm. xing and his bagua is his core art and it's a great system don't get me wrong but you know after i did so much long fist and then i was also a competitive uh, 
uh, wushu athlete i was like the last thing i feel like doing is uh more of those kind of kicks i wanted to focus more on something else and that was you know yeah and, and such a big system as well yeah, that's yeah, yeah. kind of so many forms and and stuff yeah so um also as might be of interest to you my brother-in-law does a type of mantis but from shanxi um and oh okay and it's 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 cons- i think that's quite a new creation though yeah well i mean I, I, I mean his it's a mix of mantis and singing right so it's 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 considered a soft mantis um it's it's yeah it's it's got a history that is documented the the founder down to today and it's i mean it's not new it's not like a hundred years old it's older than that um but it's in terms of mantis's history it's it's obviously a little bit newer and it has its its variation from the standard mantis that that uh most, mm. most i'll actually send you i'll send you his his link and you can take a look at this history but it is an interesting system and i did i did a little bit of that when i i went to um, my wife's hometown in which is in actually interestingly the style migrated to inner mongolia um it's ah okay i didn't know that that's interesting yeah because actually a lot of uh inner mongolian han chinese are from shanxi so the style migrated there and um uh, the the current head of the system is in Hohat in Inner Mongolia. Uh, he's still alive. He's in his eighties. He's quite old, but um, yeah, I trained with him maybe in two thousand. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, in two thousand and one or two thousand and two, just bits a little bit, and I did the style a little bit too um, for a, a mm. short period of time. But it wasn't what I wanted to learn, but it was interesting. And the old man is very very skilled. I mean, his handwork is very mm. sublime. It's it's very, he's very very good. Yeah. But I don't know how much uh, you've seen of that of that uh, style of mantas. I, I've only actually seen um, that guy in New York. I can't remember his name. Yeah. Okay. Long uh, fair. But he, he has a bit. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, he has a, a bit of an online presence. Yeah, he does. But he's. I mean, yeah. I'll sh- I'll send you some of better videos of the mantas because there's a lot of the stuff that. He's uh, shown in more recent times. It's just bits and pieces of the mantis, not so much of the mantis. Actually, I'll send mm. you some videos of his teacher. Who's, yeah, he's just he's very very good. I remember I went to study with him in winter, and I went to a park. And Inner Mongolian winter is not really a joke. Um, and, no, and I, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I went on with you know like uh, I went and met him there with in the morning with uh, you know wushu training shoes on like Feiyue type shoes, and he looked at me as like. Are you sure you want to wear those? I'm like, yeah, I always wear these. And he said, okay. And when about 20 minutes in, I think I started getting frostbite in my feet. I don't know. It's like, oh, next no. time come with boots. You literally have to train with le- yeah. leather on, you know? So, yeah. But, I bet they must have different footwork then if they're training like that a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I suppose. Um, but, you know, I could after I've done so much Xing Yi Quan, I can see a lot of the origin of a lot of their... Um, because at that time when I learned it, and since when I'd seen it before I did Xing Yichuan, I couldn't identify it. But now I can identify a lot of their, their, their Xing Yichuan, uh core, where a lot of the stuff comes from. But then again, there's also a lot of stuff that's completely different. It's it's actually quite an interesting system. Um, not yeah. not too big, but it's got some some interesting elements to it, and some interesting weaponry yeah. too, which is rather unique. So yeah. Yeah, but Mantis has had spread to Shanxi very early because the Dai family, uh, when you look at their early history, before the Dai family were doing Xin Yi Quan, they, they, they'd actually learned some mantis, I think it was Dai Long Ban, mm-hmm. had learned some mantis uh, from somebody from Shandong. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, do you know anything about that? I'm not too much about, I'm, I, I've heard about something like that, but I haven't looked into the details of it. So the form, there's a form they have called Jasha Chui, yeah, and that has preserved the uh, the mantis that they'd learnt. So it was quite interesting for me uh, when I was in Shanxi with John and Paul, and we went to Qi County, mm. and one of the guys there, Duan Tianlin, he started to show us the mantis um, stuff contained within Dai Star oh, really? and it was really interesting because it was. It was like if if you took away the Dai Style Shenfa, 
you know, you just ignore the way they're moving, but you look at the technique itself. Yeah. You could see like the very core sort of the, the oldest aspects of Shandong Mantis. Very uh, from like our the the oldest form that we do is Luanjie, and you can literally see that the the beginning of Joshua Tray was the beginning of the Luanjie form, and then some of the other stuff he showed. Uh, was straight out of uh, Bajo, which is also one of the earliest Mantis forms. I, you know, we have Zha Shui Chui in quick. Hebei, in Hebei Xingyi too. We have Zha Shui Chui. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, and no, I haven't. Maybe it'll be, I'll send that to you too. Maybe it'll be, you, you can see if there's any overlap there with what uh, what you were just mentioning. But yeah, Zha Shui Chui is, uh, uh, I mean, it's one of the core uh routines in Hebei Xingyi as well. Um, it's got uh, its key feature is that it's got this uh, repetition of, uh, of a technique called Mao Xilian or cat washes its face, mm, which is mm, like a retreating, yeah. you know, in inward block with a forearm slash elbow. Um, yeah, yeah, over and over again. So anyway, I'll send it to you and you can compare it for yourself. But it's it's also if you've ever looked at Sun Lutang Xingyi book, it's in there too. So it's uh, ah okay okay probably different. It's probably that it's in terms of the Dai Long, uh, the the Dai family stuff. It's probably just a name that was carried on and it's changed quite a bit as. Yeah, it, as probably. It. I mean, the even the five element fists were like in Dai style completely different. Yeah. To I mean, Tran was the only one that looked vaguely similar. The the other four were completely different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's a good segue into the next little bit. I mean, you, you last year started, I mean, you started Monkey Steals Peach. When did you start that uh, YouTube channel and the endeavor? Well, I, I actually started as a, I actually started as a blog in 2007 okay. when I first came to China. Um, it was just, just to, just to sort of let friends and family know what I was up to. Mm -hmm. And that kind of just evolved into after i met my teacher joe jen dong i turned it from a blog in, uh, into a proper website i bought a proper domain and everything okay i, I changed the name to monkeystealspeach.com and i started off by translating articles my teacher had written on like the history and mm. um i was collecting some documents some old documents and things on mantis and translating and putting them up there so I was, start, I was. It was originally just a website that was my own kind of research into Mantis, right? And that enabled me to start to get to know people in the uh, Chinese martial art community in the Western world. So I, I kind of had this idea that I wanted to do YouTube videos, right? For quite a long time, but I was always really camera shy, <laughs> and I'd always kind of get the camera and be like, okay, I'm going to do a video now. And it just never happened. And I kind of kept doing that for a couple of years. And it was when I met Joshua Viney, who he'd been living in Dungfeng for also like 15 years, just like going around the, the villages and training uh, all the folk styles of Shaolin and, and doing a lot of documenting and research and stuff. So it was when I got together with him that... Um, he brought up the idea of doing the Jianghu channel together. Right. Okay. That's what the, so, the channel that I found uh, the first time I saw. Yeah. Videos. Yeah. So, um, I mean, he's really good at filming as well. He got really good camera equipment and he's really talented at editing and stuff, but he, we didn't end up doing it for very long because of his own personal reasons. He ended up leaving China and going back to the UK. So oh, I was going to ask that, if he's still here. He's back yeah, in the UK. We, we had big aspirations for that, but it kind of died before it ever really got going. Mm. And I think we, we hadn't really worked on a good concept yet because I, I think the stuff we filmed, we were trying to take single moves from forms and show the applications, okay. but I, I don't think the concept worked that well because it was taken out. It was too easy to take it out of con context when you when you show it like that. So, mm. yeah, that kind of died before it really got going. Well, so I mean, I, I remember like just video. coming across those Jianghu videos, and that was exactly what stood out for me. Is what you said the 
really good editing, really good filming, but also it was good content. And I mean, Josh is obviously trained hard. Joshua, sorry, not Josh. I don't know. Yeah, he's trained very hard. So you, it comes across when you when you see him doing his performances too. And it was interesting because mm. I think one of the videos came across the Xingyi Chuan Facebook group like, I don't know, eight years ago. And I remember, I mean, usually we don't keep content in there that's not Xingyi related. But I remember just leaving it in there and just commenting. It's a really, really nicely made video, you know. Mm. So I thought mm. there was going to be a lot more. But now that you've mentioned that he left, I understand why, why it's uh, kind of not as active as I thought it would be. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of a shame because we, yeah, like I say, we had big aspirations for it, but he had his own personal stuff. So, right, right. Yeah, that got cut short. So then I thought, okay, well, I've got my Monkey Steals Peach website, and I now have some experience with YouTube. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make a channel. Mm. And um, I thought, well, I haven't got anybody to film with, so what can I do? I can, uh, you know, go use my Chinese language ability and. I was also thinking that there's not a, a whole lot of um, like first-hand source material out there. I mean, there's there's a lot of these old videos. Like if you look at like the Tea Serpent channel, right. things like that. You know, stuff from the early '90s that's filmed on really grainy old cameras yeah. of old masters doing forms. But there wasn't really anything where people are just letting teachers just talk about what they do yes, yeah. and and i kind of i wanted to just try and show people the atmosphere of like how it is to go and just spend time with these people right the, the difference you know the different not just the different styles of martial art but the different styles of like the different atmospheres of training like you've got some of the guys in their courtyards in villages mm. you've got people in parks you've got people that have got their own large schools and you've got some people that are very good and some people that are not so good and i just kind of wanted to show without any bias or any sort of agenda um agenda yeah just to try and show purely like what's it like in china to do martial arts and what are the styles here yeah what are the martial artists themselves like how do they teach you know, what's their personality like, just to try and show that, really. Right. And what's what is it like actually training? I mean, it's a lifestyle. I mean, that's something mm. that I've had the hardest time trying to convey. It's like, you know, people be like, yeah, I train martial arts and uh, Westerners and in their countries. And I'm like, OK, so you do Chinese martial arts. Yeah, man, I've been doing it like seriously. I'm like, oh, OK, so when do you train? I go on Mondays and Wednesdays from seven to eight. And I'm like, you know. I mean, I know you're passionate and whatever, but it really has, it is a lifestyle here. It's a lifestyle. Mm. I mean, it's like every day that is just, you eat, but you also go down and train. Like when I was with, when I'm with my teacher, it was every single day, you know, I mean, and it's not as if you go there and it's like, all right, class time and now do this and now do that. Sometimes I'd go there and he would utter five words to me in three hours. You know, I would just be doing my thing. And he'd be watching and he'd be doing his thing too mm, sometimes. Mm. But it's very hard for people to realize that it's just a way of life for most of the traditional people here. It's not, it's part of their life, just like that. You know, it's not something separate, yeah. you know. It's interesting. I think, if I think, yeah, um, how do I word this? I think the issue is, like, if you just want to learn to fight, I think that there's, you know, let's be real. There's there's better things you can you can choose if you want to just get really good at fighting. Just go and do MMA or Muay Thai or, or whatever. But yeah. I think yeah, the whole thing is it's a whole lifestyle and it encompasses it encompasses fighting and it encompasses uh, health aspects and it. But it encompasses a lot more than that. It's it's kind of the community. You know, yeah. it's being part of something. You have your teacher. You have your your kung fu brothers and sisters you have your kung fu uncles and you know you, you get together you train there's no like you say that it's not like they blow a whistle and you all line up and do a warm-up right you know people come along at different times and 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 they do some stretching and then start training and 
you, you know, you finish training, some people will leave, some people will hang around longer, and then sometimes Shifu will be like, hey, you guys want to come up to my apartment and drink some tea? Exactly. Or you might go out for, like, hot pot and end up having some beers, and, you know, and you're always learning, because when the more time you spend with your teacher, like, you don't necessarily get all of the... He doesn't necessarily explain everything, during the actual physical training sometimes it's just you're in his apartment and you're drinking some tea and he'll just mention in passing like once some really important principle right those are the best actual discussions a lot of the time yeah yeah or when you're drinking as well and, and you know you'll sort of loosen up and you start doing arm locks on each other right. in like a little room in the back of a restaurant yeah isn't it isn't it interesting because that was one of the things that i found like other westerners when they'd come to meet my teacher or train with my teacher and then after training we'd go have a meal together and he'd you know we'd start drinking baijiu you know and they'd be like yeah. wait a minute what, master is drinking and i'm like yes but i thought kung fu people don't drink I'm like, no, no, you got it backwards. The Kung Fu people drink the most. That's probably how it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and it's, that's part of it, really. That is part of the whole thing. I mean, there's so many times that I've, when I've gotten together with my teacher and some of my uncles too, you know, his, his younger or older Kung Fu brothers. And then it really gets raucous at times, you know, from just from the volume of the conversation down to the drinking down to people getting up and you know trying things on each other it's just it's just and and that is that is so much part of the training i don't i it's hard to explain but that is a part of the training the whole thing it's part of the whole experience yeah i know what you mean it's difficult i think it's difficult to try and get this across to people that haven't experienced it yeah yeah well yeah i mean that's that's that's, I think, a good endeavor that you started with with Monkey Steel's Peach. And last year, you you was last year the was the was the Shingi um, series your first focused series that you decided to do. Um, no, the the first really focused one was the villages around Shaolin Temple, and then I did the Shingi after that. Oh, okay. Actually, that was it. Yes, it was. I remember now. And was was your interest in Shaolin? I mean, did you practice a lot of Shaolin when you were working with Joshua, or did you? Was it just something you were interested in in terms of documenting and showing? I, I kind of, I kind of indirectly. I like. He, it's not like he specifically taught me any any forms or techniques, but yeah, we we trained together a lot and we exchanged a lot. So he really opened my eyes to the principles of the art and mm. and the applications and i was doing a little bit of shiny liu okay. as well and so there was a lot of there was a lot of crossover because of the shaolin shiny ba right um so it was, so we were kind of just having like informal exchanges with that and also when i was being his demo partner when he was filming a lot of applications and stuff mm. so i was getting quite familiar with shaolin through that but i did end up uh, learning a bit when i went to dung Feng and i was staying at hu jung chung school so i got to do some training with them and i learned a little bit there that's an interesting sort of, uh, i mean that whole <laughs> shiny and who's who's group there um what uh, did joshua do any of the shiny ba was he his student or did he learn from somebody else or i mean in in that regard with shiny ba uh no, he learned from Tui Shi Chi, who was one who he Tui Shi Chi died in twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, I think. Mm. Uh, so that that Tui Shi Chi was Josh's main teacher, and then he continued training with his son Tui Zhongwu, okay. uh, who I interviewed in that series. Right. Um, but he, he was quite difficult to interview because he was a very eclectic guy, and he was also quite secretive as well. Um, he showed quite a lot of interesting stuff, but when I said to him about Shiniba, he's just like, Bujida, Like, I don't know anything. I don't know what Shiniba is. But actually, Josh uh, told me that he, he learned, he did learn all the Shiniba stuff from, from Tsui. But typically, most of them are very, like, most of the teachers in Dongfeng, they know it, but they mm -hmm. kind of regard Shiniba as, like, the, I guess, the 
secret or most advanced material that they don't share with outsiders. But uh, Hu Zhengsheng and the the other guy um, Shi De Jian and Wu Nanfang, the, the, those guys are usually paired together. I think they they co-run a school or something. Right. So those two groups. Uh, they teach the Xinyiba quite openly. There is a bit of difference, though, between what uh, Shi De Jian and, and, and Hu is teaching, though. I mean, do they come from the same teacher? I don't know the exact lineage, but they are both... Okay, they are both from the same lineage, but I don't quite know how far back they mm. separated. I just know that they're from someone called Wugulun, but I don't know how many generations back uh, they sort of, yeah, separate, separated. I don't think they both had the same teacher. Maybe it was the same grand teacher or great grand teacher right. is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Shiniba thing is quite interesting because if we look at the timeline of Deng Feng's more modern history, you know, um, you know, the, after the Shaolin Temple, things, the movie, the, the things exploded there. And and even at that period of that mass explosion, Shinipa was not on the lips of anyone. You know, it wasn't something that was really, you know, spread out there. I mean, Shaolin was the, the, was the hot topic and the style was the hot topic and it was really exploding. I mean, let, let's be honest, worldwide it was exploding. But not Shiniba remained relatively, uh, you know, part of the in Xingyi, We understand that you know that that myth and not myth, but that history, and it's kind of myth. It's it's become a myth because you know we, we, there wasn't much to see from what was Shiniba. But you know, in more recent times, you could see Shiniba has become quite a, a little bit more exposed. I don't know if that. Yeah, I, I suppose is. it's. Maybe it's like, uh, you know, if we go back to saying the sort of superficial nature of what's what they're doing at the temple, yeah. I think maybe uh, Hu Zhengsheng and, and Shi De Jian, maybe they sort of, I'm just guessing here, I don't know, but maybe they sort of saw that and were like, okay, well, let's have something a bit deeper mm. that we can, you know, we can market and we can have people coming to us that are sort of disillusioned with the temple and you know we can show them the more traditional or more sort of like the deeper stuff right, right. but you, you said that there wasn't really any talk of Shiniba there is actually a video of Yang Guiwu which is uh, Hu Zhengsheng's teacher mm. doing Shiniba in the you know the hall I've with all seen the dips that in the floor. I've seen that yeah that that must be like the 80s or 90s that video but I mean even if you go down to look at um the Shorinji Kempo guys that came over from Japan, they, mm. even they weren't really exposed to that stuff. And these were guys that were trying to get to the meat, well, the marrow of, of Shaolin and, and they based their entire mm. organization on it, you know? So it's really interesting that that was, you know, kept out of the slime, out of the limelight for so long. And uh, yeah, does... I just want yeah. wonder if, because the... When they, I mean, you'll probably know quite a bit about this as well from your involvement in the association and stuff, but it was a case of when they, they rebuilt the temple after the Jet Li movie, mm. and they brought in people from the outside to kind of bring Shaolin Chuan back to the temple. So there was a mixture. I mean, I know that they were bringing people from the Beijing Sports University, like Wushu coaches, weren't they? Yeah, I've, ac I've actually worked time, very closely with a couple of the people that were tasked with doing that. Um, that. They even brought a couple of Mansis teachers from Qingdao over as well. That's where the Sh uh, Shaolin Mansis comes from. Well, um, but... Yeah. Yeah, sorry, you were going to ask Yeah, something. I was going to say something. Actually, um, interestingly, the the podcast episode that's going to come out this month, now in, in um, April, is with a guy that I've known since he was a young kid. Um, and his name is Chris Wong. Um, his Chinese name is uh, Guan Nan. His surname is Wong. And uh, he grew up, uh, for the most part, in South Africa. But his dad came over. Uh, his dad was 
was actually a martial arts teacher at my high school. We get into that in that episode because I went to a, I went to a Chinese high school, and um, his dad was the teacher there. But his dad was the actor in the movie The Shaolin Temple. He acted as the Emperor Li Shimin who was running away that they protected. He was ah, he was that actor. Okay. Wow, that's interesting. So I or, yeah. I mean I spoke to him like way back when, and he told he told me so many stories about when they were filming the the, the movie that. There was no one at the temple. The temple was basically abandoned. There was like one or two people mm. actually in the temple and none of them knew martial arts. Uh, you know, it was, it was, there wasn't martial arts in the temple. But after the movie, as you said, they tried to rebuild it because, because the movie made it so popular that people were trying to come back there or trying to come learn and kids were, you know, People were running from the other side of China to go to the Shaolin Temple to learn, you know, but there's nothing there. So they did try to rebuild it. And your friend Joshua, who did all that research around the temple, he probably know better what what was used as a basis for that creation of the curriculum in the Shaolin Temple. Yeah, well, I know that his teacher was one of the people they brought in. I'm sure, yeah. Tui uh, CT. I think there was 10 Okay. Yeah. Ten, maybe ten teachers in Dongfang that were involved in because um, obviously the Shaolin styles of you know Hong Chuan, Tong Dei Chuan, mm. Pao Chuan, Luohan Chuan, whatever were all practiced in the whole area. Not not just Dongfang, but you know even in Zhengzhou, in Luoyang, in uh, Anyang, yeah, yeah, Nanyang, yeah. even as far as Anhui, uh, Shaolin. You know, Shaolin, it wasn't even called Shaolin Chuan before. It, it was just you know it was just called like it was. Dung Feng Chuan right, right. Or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, these styles were like really widespread all over Hunan. So almost every village in the Dung Feng area has some has martial arts to some extent. So this myth that all oh, Shaolin Kung Fu is lost because the temple was burnt down and all the monks were killed and, mm. and now what's there is fake. It's kind of bullshit really because the whole area is just a, a hotbed for martial arts and yeah well martial arts went into the yeah. temple that's what a lot of people have this basic idea that they think that there was the seed it grew in the shaolin temple it became shaolin kung fu and then it spread out it was actually the other way around in in reality right it was just a hub it yeah. was a hub of exchange you know where people would come and exchange stuff yeah you know, I mean, I have, I remember a couple of the professors that I worked with that were that went back to the temple to teach some of the troops there and to to try, you know, to create some sort of a standardized curriculum. And I remember the one, the he's I won't mention his name, but he's a very high up, uh, well well known professor that uh, had a huge part in the in the movement. He's retired now; he's quite old now. But um, he told me that he saw some of the. Um, the, the traditional versions, methods of doing some techniques like in Xiao Hongquan. Um, I, I don't know how, what the name of the technique is. I'm not, I'm not proficient in the style. I don't practice it. But it's that if you step back, they step back and do that forearm kind of block down to the one side and one is down and one is up. And then the next mm. movement, they step forward with a push palm in Gungbu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that technique, he told me that they actually used to circle their palm. They didn't used to push it out dead straight. For this, now, I'm, I'm just repeating what he told me. So he said he told them to push it out straight because it looks better and it's faster. But when I looked at the technique, when I looked at the technique, um, if you just look at it and with a circle if you had to do that that uh, preceding movement and then step forward and do a circular movement it's actually very close to taiji chuan's danbian you know um single whip mm. and then it kind of i kind of looked at that and i thought hang on a minute but the application would be changed so dramatically if you just change it from a circle to a push and i didn't mention this to him because you know i just let him finish his story but in my mind it it kind of made some some additional alarm bells go off like if they did this on a large scale with a with 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 changing of routines and that that created the standardized curriculum with the aim of looking better being snappier how much was changed and lost from the original intention and method so 
you know, I'm sure it's still around in the temple, uh, around the temple in the villages. But, you know, within what's what's become of the official Shaolin curriculum, as you said, quite superficial, etc. I mean, it's very understandable that it's gone that way. And it's kind of a pity. Well, they they separate forms and sanda anyway. Yeah. So, you know, even even when they do do the traditional forms like Hongchen or Tongdae, they're not exploring the applications or the right, principles. Right. They're just doing the forms and then they're doing sanda. But what's interesting is some of the monks in the temple actually do go to the old teachers. They actually go out to the villages okay. and, and train the old styles and bring them back. So it's not quite, it's not quite so black and white just to say like, Oh, in the temple, there's no real old Shaolin. It's all just modern standardized Mm. stuff. It's a little bit more complicated than that because they do have like different, they do have quite a few different coaches within the temple. And I think they specialize in different things. And some of them are really into the old stuff. Well, I hope, I hope, I mean, (laughs) I, you know, I've seen it as well, but I hope, that that continues and i think there is a kind of an understanding even within china within within martial arts even within the official body that they've kind of realized that what happened and the direction it's gone is kind of a mistake and it's maybe beneficial to go back and look at and learn some of the uh, you know the traditional methods and and see what 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 is included in there i think there is a bit of a a perception that is kind of shifted in at least privately within private individuals not probably yeah not i don't least. think they'll admit it no. because of all you know no no face and everything like that but but yeah privately I, I do think so yeah yeah so okay well we got onto the topic of the shaolin series and then you moved on to the xingyi series what sparked you to 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 cover xingyi chuan as as your second series I, I thought it's because, I mean, I, I learned a little bit of Xin Yi mm. in Shanghai, but I became disillusioned with it because everybody here was basically just trying to rip me off and, you know, they, they were just charging me a load of money but not not really wanting to teach me mm. anything. Mm. And, you know, I, I couldn't really be bothered jumping through all their hoops to try and win over their trust because I, I've, I've kind of done that for so many years. Right with mantis so i was just like okay no this this is not for me but i I've, i did keep an interest in it although i stopped learning it right um and then when i was i was thinking over shinny lil and also my friend john who you know yeah practices a song style shinny so I, I i got talking to him and came up with this idea like i thought it would be really cool to because shinny has a very clear history mm. of you know there's a very clear progression that you can see through each family right from whether you're looking at Xinyi Ba, Xinyi Liu He, Dai family, Song, Che, Hebei. Right. It's a very clear progression. I thought that would be really interesting to you know to, to try and go through every single one of those branches and uh, film people doing it to try and show that progression. Right. Well, that is... An, uh, and it Although what I, right. what I realized while actually filming mm. was that it wasn't quite the linear progression that I thought. But anyway, still, that's that's how the idea came up. Yeah, I'm sure you, you kind of... Yeah, I, I kind of got the feeling that when, from what you just said and remembering the series that you probably realized, hang on, this, this road is not as straight as I thought it was. It's kind of crooked and windy. So... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. You kept it quite a, a quite a British affair. I mean, you had, uh, um, uh, well, all three of you that went were were British. Did you know? Did you all know each other from from England or only through martial arts online, basically? Uh, well, John used to live in Shanghai, and we 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 were part of a we were part of a group that used to get together on the weekends to spar and train in the park. Okay, very nice. And then. But then he moved. He moved off to Hong- his work. Then uh, sent him off to Hong Kong. So he left. And Paul, I met Paul because he's actually from Yorkshire as well. I didn't, I didn't actually know him when I was in Yorkshire. But um, I met him. He came over to Shanghai. I think you met him in Beijing yeah, as well. Yeah. I think he went up to Beijing first. 
Yeah, so he came down to Shanghai for a, f- a few days. I think he he was interested in Shin Iloha, so I took him to meet my teacher, and um, he also got together with John, and they did some training. Okay. So that was when I first met him a few years ago, so I thought it would be cool to... I know he'd, he'd been interested in coming back to China and, and filming something too, so I said, hey, why don't we just all do this together? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it came out, or it came out, it was... a. Uh... Interesting. I think for a lot of people, at least with maybe not within Xingyi circles, seeing a lot of it, or maybe a lot of the stuff they had seen before. But I think a lot of people outside of Xingyi circles actually got some exposure that, well, that that wasn't. I mean, they wouldn't really go out of their way to search for it. But I think through your your series, a lot of people said, "Well, you know, this is interesting. Let me take a look." and I think Shingi got a lot more exposure with your series. And I mean, I'm sure there's much more you wanted to do. I mean, even when I film something and I finish it, I'm never happy with it. I always think I could have done more. But, yeah. It's hard because you have an idea of what you want teachers to show. But you know how that sort of generation of Chinese think and behave. It's... It, you know, it never it never goes to plan. So what I realized quite early on filming this stuff is just stop having any plans, stop having any questions in my mind. Just go with the camera right. and just stick the camera on and be like, okay, show me something, and then just kind of let it naturally progress. Right. So yeah, there was a lot of stuff I would have liked um, to have to have seen, but. Like, for example, the Dai family mm. guys, it was very hard getting them to really show much. The, the, ironically, the one video that got the most views was the one Dai style guy, uh, Duan Tianlin. And he was really, really good, but it was just impossible to film him because we, he was in this tiny little village, really remote village in Qi County. Mm. We had to get a taxi there for about an hour out of the town. And as soon as we arrived, it started pissing it down with rain. And he was in this little countryside house with really bad lighting. So we couldn't film inside. Yeah. We had to wait for the rain to stop. And then when the rain stopped, his one of his students turned up. And this guy was just a complete asshole. Oh, no. He kept, like, he, he, yeah, he, he just took over everything. And he kept, like, literally standing in front of the cameras to try and stop you know stop too much being shown and when his teacher would start explaining he would interrupt oh well that's and, that's uh, actually kind of i mean that's you know i've seen i've met people like that but i mean i can't believe that he's a long-term student if he was interrupting his own teacher i mean i've seen that with with people that practice but they're generally short-term people or haven't trained very long and they disappear eventually i mean that's a bit weird. I don't. I don't know how good this guy was. I mean, he he had the gift of the gap. He 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 trained every style in China. And oh, he's one of those. Body, but... He's one of those. Okay. I mean, the, the teacher was in his mid eighties, and yeah. he wasn't gonna like argue back with this guy. So he just kind of just went with it. But then the bit that we did film, there was this bloody little kid running around. I saw. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it should have been maybe. I think it would have been if it have it have gone to plan the most in depth interview we'd done, but it, it just was a complete disaster, unfortunately. But off camera, when we talked to him before and when he'd shown us stuff, just you know, when we were in this kind of dark room drinking tea, um, he, there were there was a lot of really really interesting stuff that we mm. that we just didn't get to show. So from that series of your, the Xingyi series, what was your most memorable moment or time? It's hard to say because they're all so, so different. Mm. Um, the Cho family one was quite interesting, I suppose. Cause, um, John had, had got in touch with these guys through his Song family connections. Mm. And we didn't even have, like, it wasn't like we had one person's name or anything. It was just like, oh, we're going to meet some Cher-style chur people. And we went out to this abandoned factory. Yeah. And there was, like, coal dust all over the floor. And, like, 30-odd guys all just showed up with cigarettes in their mouth and tattoos on their arms and the T-shirts rolled up, you know, just like the local here <laughs> or something. 
And then they put on this this big performance for us, and one by one they all got up and showed their forms. And then um, the the main guy uh, gave us kind of like a demonstration explanation of the twelve animals and stuff. And then one by one, just random people just kept coming up and like they wanted to have a try with the foreigners and they were just kind of manhandling manhandling us yeah um, some of them were good some of them were not um and you know paul's a big guy so quite a few of them they they, they thought they were better than they were and, and one particular guy thought he could take on paul and paul ended up pushing him into the wall <laughs> like the, the, he just ended up countering him like the guy attacked paul he really went for him and Paul just kind of turned turned around, deflected it, and just like thrust the guy into the wall. Yeah, yeah, I get that. You get, then, you know, uh, that's maybe something Paul because he hasn't really trained here. He doesn't know that uh, that is actually something you got to be wary of when somebody says, "Hey, let's try something," or you know, that they're actually yeah, going to try yeah. take your head off. And I've had that numerous times. So. Yeah, and then we went for a dinner with these guys. Uh, in 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 some little dingy restaurant afterwards and there was a lot of drinking and um yeah the the three of us got some pretty bad bruises <laughs> yeah because these guys were tense to, <laughs> and just add alcohol and then uh, it gets even worse yeah. so yeah yeah your last but, i mean there's that many you, you couldn't like you couldn't resist too much because you don't want a full-on fight right. to break out because it's three of you versus like 20 odd right. 20 plus of them yeah. so you're kind of trying to be be respectful while you're having your throat jabbed and the top of your head smashed with a peach van and you bung trend into your stomach right. or whatever <laughs> yeah i know it's a bit of a, a you were in a situation that uh, was uh, you had bigger considerations at the time than your uh, than your what's your own well face i suppose and then keeping face yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah, and then you moved on to the the southern the the Fujian and the southern systems that you you've basically I mean that was quite recent that you finished that that series. Yeah, I, I actually what I was actually planning to um, go to Hebei in Beijing. Actually, initially, what I wanted to do was I wanted to get in touch with you mm. and try and do something in Beijing with you, and then go off to Hebei to like Tanzhou and some of the other parts of Hebei and look at classical northern styles. Right. Um, but then Jesse Enkamp got in contact with me and was like, he wanted to come to China mm. and do the look, at, look for the roots of karate in Fujian. So, and I, I had not really had any experience with Southern stuff except the Wing Chun that I'd done as a teenager. So yeah. I thought it'd be kind of interesting. So I agreed to, to do this series with him and I, so I, I organized all of that and I got in touch with people. In, I didn't know anybody in Fujian. So I was literally just like searching on WeChat, like the the various different styles and trying to see who's who in Fuzhou and Quanzhou and then just literally adding these features on WeChat and seeing who would, you know, who, who would accept my request and, right. and was interested in being interviewed. It worked out really well because I got in touch with like, got most of the main guys there and they're all very open and they're a lot more used to foreigners down there yeah it seems that way because they've they've had all these you know groups of karate people from japan and from the west coming since the 80s so they're really familiar with the whole you know people coming with a camera and filming right that um, there was a guy that uh, was the secretary of you mentioned a few times he was the secretary of some local uh, association uh, that was with you guys. Oh, of the Fujo, the Fujo Martial Art Association. Yeah, he's. Se- yeah, I ended up. He seemed to be quite a helpful and willing guy. I mean, from what I saw, you were there, but from what I saw on the videos. Yeah, um, he was really great because he'd lived in New Zealand for like eight years oh, okay. or something. Um, so he's very uh, modern, young, Western, Westernized kind of, you know. Yeah, mentality. Uh, international guy. Yeah. But he's also very passionate about martial arts. I mean, he he originally learned uh, Shang Dian Chan or incense shop boxing, uh, boxing yeah. from I think I think he's he'd started it with his father, 
So he's, he's from a martial art family, and then he got into Crane, into White Crane, and um, he, had, he, he trained with a few different teachers in Fuzhou, but he'd also been going over to Taiwan um, to train with Liu Changyi, who's the main guy for Feeding Crane, which is one of the branches, because yeah. that's... It's not completely lost in China, but it's uh, very, very rare in mainland China now. Right. So he he was going to Taiwan to learn it, to try and kind of bring it back, I suppose. To feed that crane and revive it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've been to Taiwan quite a few times and the crane, the white crane in Taiwan is really strong. It really is one of their strongest styles that they, they practice there, contrary to what people believe. I mean, Taiwan's got... S- Two styles, well, two main styles that I'd say are very, very strong. White Crane being one of them and Golden Eagle being another one. And, uh, yeah, they're very good over there. Okay, the Golden Eagle I haven't heard of. But if I was going to go to Taiwan um, to film something in the future, yeah, one is I've got a couple of Mantis friends over there Mm. who had studied with people that had left with the Guomindan in 1949. So they've got good, strong... Um, mantis lineages i'd like to go and and meet them but yeah mainly i I would like to look at the southern stuff there the the crane and the wuzu chan and they've got some really obscure um styles in taiwan i've seen that are kind of like a mix of two or three different Mm. different ones there's like taizu hua he luohan hua he like it's always something hua something else okay interesting uh, that, that that look, they, they look quite strange, and I just thought it, you know, kind of exotic. It would be quite interesting to go over there and explore them. Yeah, and you know what? You, I, I actually wanted to say this earlier when we were talking about Shaolin as a term, um, and and incense box, uh, incense shop boxing would would. I mean, you could consider that Shaolin as a term too, and uh, you know, my teacher from his original teacher who taught him Xing Yichuan, when he was young and he first started training with them, he taught him what he called Shaolin Quan, and it it included a whole bunch of things, uh, including things like Shao Qi Qiang and Da Qi Qiang, which is, if you translate it, I would say, small strange spear and big strange spear. And I know I've I've spoken to people in Dengfeng that also practice that. So, I mean, it's a very, it's a very widespread and very broad term. What what Shaolin was. Um, in China, but even back then, even today, so a lot of the systems use these these names, and even Wuzu. I mean, Wuzu is a perfect example because they make references to what you'd consider Shaolin. You know, within this their content. Yeah, well, they have the whole mythology of the Southern Shaolin Temple down. Right, so. right. So, but I'm still kind of trying to work out in my own head, like, is it is it just a myth or? Like I, I don't think there was quite a southern Shaolin temple. I think that's maybe a bit too much. Yeah. But um, I, I do know that Qi Ji Guang and Yu Da Yo, they you know they did have um, Shaolin monks like employed in the militia. Right. So I do wonder if they you know maybe some of the monks just stayed down there and they had some kind of little like station or base or something. There was actually a but village those, those, outside of Fuzhou, those... Shaolin village. Yeah, so. those monks, sorry to cut you off, but in that time, a lot of those monks were, it was about their staff techniques, you know, so mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see that that is not the thing that's labeled and linked to Shaolin more profusely throughout China is this staff or Gun Shu is uh, such and such Shaolin Gun, you know, it's, that's not really what we see. So yeah, sorry, you were saying about the village or something, a, a station outside a village there. Oh, yeah, yeah, just, just that there was all these different references to Shaolin mm. uh, in Fujian. Like this, there was a village called Shaolin Village, and there was a, a couple of different temples that all have historical records. So they say, I haven't actually looked at them personally, but they say, oh, yeah, we were called Shaolin Temple or whatever in the past. So there is definitely, it, it's definitely something embedded in Fujian folklore. Mm. So... I don't know, like you say, it was all weapon stuff back then. Maybe that's why the northern and southern styles are so different because they evolved independently. Yeah. But they still drew on that Shaolin folklore. 
So while they don't have any real physical connection, they still share a lot of the terminology just because of the folklore they drew on. Right, right. Oh, and another thing, I don't know if you've... Have you read um, uh, the, that book by Mayor Shahar, The Shaolin Monastery? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, it is. And I mean, it's interesting to note that um, Shaolin wasn't the, wasn't the only temple known for its uh, proficient monks with staffs. There was another temple called Funyu, Funyu Su. Funyu right, that's also in Hunan, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and those monks were also employed and used in these groups that you mentioned earlier. Monks from Funyu were also yeah. used. So, you know, I've always like taken a, a, a thinking about um, two things. Like, a lot of the northern styles, we can say, well, a lot of the northern martial arts were, were things that came out of weapons, you know, that... Uh, Weapons were the staple, and then as time went on in in folk or social circles, bare hand methods were developed. But weapons were 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 something that that was, you know, the the underlying feature or the underlying root of a lot of these bare hand systems. And yeah, and, and we the I found a lot of the opposite in the south in the southern styles that they're they're almost pure trenfa. They're bare hand systems that evolved on independently of weapons and and the, yeah and then they sort of put the weapons on top right like as an addition yeah and they drew a lot of their weapon work from northern weapon uh methods as opposed to mm. and and that's quite interesting because that can that, that would result in a very different you know methodology body mechanics and approach to to the barehanded methods, you know. So I mean, it's it's mm. the, the the weapon techniques are are plastered all over the barehand uh, systems in the north. You could see it from the the methods of chopping, swinging, etc. Those are all like put the yeah, put the yeah. sword down and the way you move your body. As right, well. a, a lot of it's coming from you know manipulating a large spear or exactly halberd or whatever exactly so it's an interesting thing i'm surprised that you never thought about doing a a mantis documentary series seeing as that's you know your style did you ever consider that yeah um there's a couple of reasons why i've not done it yet uh one is that i guess that there's quite a lot of politics between different lineages of mantis and uh i i could see a lot of issues arising from me going around different teachers of different styles of mantis in shandong mm. you know gossip and talk behind my back and things that you know that would get back to my teacher right. and, and maybe cause an issue for him and another one is that i find being being a martial artist who speaks chinese but still not being of the style that the interviewee is is uh, a practitioner of gives me uh, allows them to be a little bit more open mm. you know I, I still understand martial arts and I understand the language and everything so there's no issue with communication right. but just because I'm coming from a different style there's no sort of like oh well is he trying to get this yeah, technique okay. off us or is he trying yeah. to learn this shen fa from us is he going to take this back to his own teacher? Or is he going to film this and make us look bad and make his style look better or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's there's that as well. But yeah, may, maybe in the future it would be interesting to to explore. Mm. But, but for, for now, I'm, I'm, I'm more focused on other stuff. I also kind of... Um, I'm, I'm more interested now in looking at, like, really old styles as well to try and kind of go further back in time and look at mm. styles that are like the building blocks of uh particularly looking at northern stuff because that's mostly my focus right. but yeah to, to find the styles that are kind of the building blocks so i'd like to do something on uh all different styles that call themselves tongbei because that's okay. yeah a very old system a very old term and also looking at like yeah, Tuojia Fanza, some of these very old yeah uh, long fist styles as well. Yeah, because I think that can be something that whatever style you practice, you can look at and you can see. You know, those are things that have influenced right, like a whole range of styles. So 
everybody can watch and kind of take something from well, it I mean, and maybe understand yeah, yeah. their system yeah. a bit more. Well, I, I don't know if you know, like uh, there's been a lot of uh, research done into Dong Hai Chuan's uh, youth, his village, um, his family um, from where he grew up and his family, you know, uh, that was around him. Um, and, you know, it's he he learned Bafan Shou, uh, you know, what but became what Fan Chuan includes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and there's a lot of uh, research into that being one of the core because he he was versed in that amongst other styles that were popular in, the, in that area of Hebei, including some of the ones that you just mentioned, and you can see some overlaps in certain parts of Bagua's basis and those styles too. So he's like you said, building blocks. It's they're there. Mm. They're there. Yeah. It's funny how people. And there was also don't, don't, something. Really sorry, I mean, I'm. I'm, I'm into, sorry, there's a bit of a, a disconnect with our yeah. connection, I think. But I wanted to ask you: Did you uh, did you not find? Do you ever find it quite? I mean, I find this all the time. But Westerners specifically, but it's also some idea here that they think that suddenly a style pops out of uh, into creation out of thin air, uh, you know. And and if you try to try to tell them, well, no, he learned this system and that before, and then this, they take offense to it. When you, as if yeah. you know, it's very interesting. It's a very strange train of thought that they have because in their mind, and I think it's a natural thing that people think. They think the older, the more original, the better. So if you're saying that his style was a result of him learning these other styles, it means that these other styles are older and better. And, that, and that's a, I mean, I get that really. We actually that is a pervasive idea in Chinese thought. Actually, the the great ancestors were supremely knowledgeable and wise and you know compared to to us today they knew much more than us well even confucius was venerating like the people from the you know he thought that the the emperors of the Zhou dynasty were like the, the you know the ideal people people that he looked up to so it's something that goes right back to the beginning of chinese history yeah, i guess yeah. well you had it with um qi ji guang who included uh uh, later texts that included writing about uh, gunpowder or hot weapons and uh, he had to add the line in there that said and of course these 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 were handed down from our great ancestors so <laughs> meanwhile there were new yeah. new inventions <laughs> so, yeah it's very interesting yeah. so sorry you were saying something that i cut you off there i, I was going to ask you about um fanza trend because mm. there was something quite interesting that i there's a bit of an idea I've been putting together in my mind that when eventually I can go to Hebei, I want to try and explore. You might have some some idea on this. Um, so I saw this documentary a few years ago about Pigua Chen. Okay. Pigua Zhang. And in it, one of the teachers from Tangzhou, he was like reciting some poem from an old manuscript. And he said that before, Pigua used to be called Fan Che Lulu Chui. Oh. Have you ever heard that? No. I'm... Because in Mantis, one of the building blocks of Mantis is Fancha Lulu Tray, and it's like that's plastered all over our old manuscripts. So when I heard him say that, and then he went on to like recite an entire like poem, Fancha Lulu Tray, Liu Liu San Liu or something, and then it kind of went on from there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, that's like one of the building blocks of Mantis, and he's saying it as Pigua. So. Well, it, it's it's pro- it's very possible, of course. You know, it really is. I I'm not I'm not a researcher, and I've never researched into Pigua that much. But it's very possible. Pigua, Tongbei, Fanzi. There's there's probably a very there they probably share some very important building block that is the same you know so mm. and and the 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 term or the name that you said with with a title having chue at the end also gives a little bit more of its older dating just with that so yeah yeah oh we use chue all the time we never say chue yeah. in mantis we always say chue yeah but yeah, yeah so that that's that's something that i mean would be interesting to see what you find out from that yeah, because I'd quite like to look at uh, Fanza specifically, because I think that's the possibly the root of that kind of wheeling, you know, arm wheeling type right. stuff. Right. Right. Of which which a lot of those styles come from. Mm. So. Yeah, and Tongbei, um, the same person that uh, I mentioned earlier, whose father was uh, in the Shaolin Temple movie that's on this this 
this uh, podcast that's coming out next week. I'll release it. He's uh, he does he currently does Wuxing Tongbei as well, uh, Five Element Tongbei. Ah, so, okay. yeah. yeah, he discusses quite a lot of that. So maybe you want to hear that when when I release it. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. It's a, it's a funny thing though, Tongbei, because there's so many styles throughout China called Tongbei yeah. or Tongbi, but like some of them, they like in Shanxi, they've got the Hongdong one, which is basically an offshoot of Chen style Taiji Chuan, right? Yeah. Well, and then you've got who knows. <laughs> Tongbei in Hunan that looks like long fist and there's all sorts of different things all called Tongbei yeah. that seem to have no connection to each other. So that was one thing I was interested well, in. Well, Tongbei as a, as a principle is quite pervasive in northern Chinese martial arts. That the, t- the mm, two arms yeah. connect through the back into one, you know, that's yeah, uh, yeah. in terms of issuing force. So that's a pervasive idea. So yeah, I mean, it'll also be interesting to see what what can be dug up from there in terms of, of that so right now you're in australia and you're studying there so you're going to be there for some time <coughs> yeah so i was i mean i've I've still got a valid china china visa for the next three years mm. and of course i it's only a flight away anyway so it's not really going to affect well the coronavirus now well, it's affecting is, everything though i i would <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I was planning to come back to China in June. I was going to go up and spend some time with my teacher mm. in Yantai and do some training. And then I wanted to go to Malaysia and look at some Fujian styles there. Yeah. But yeah, that's all on hold now. Well, yeah, I mean, I think everybody's plans for everything are on hold for the foreseeable future. Yeah. yeah. My teacher's yeah. actually in Australia now because his daughter moved to Australia uh, probably more than 15 i say maybe 15 years ago and she lives in oh uh, yeah okay. she lives in melbourne she's always been there as, as, as uh, ah, okay. she's a nurse and um luckily in december uh, my teacher and shirmu his wife went down there and that was before all of this you know occurred so i'm i'm mm. and they've just their plan was he was going to come back around chinese new year's time was his plan but that all just they cancelled it and they stayed there thankfully because i'd hate for them to have been you know older people with the risks involved and whatever so he's still down there yeah Yeah. but i think melbourne's one of the places that's got more coronavirus cases in australia now like out here in perth because we're so remote i mean it's just kind of once you leave the city it's just desert and uh, wheat fields really so we're, we're quite lucky here there's not that many cases yeah. compared to like Sydney and Melbourne over there. But yeah, well, you know, they're old. They stay home all the time. So the reality, the risk yeah. of them is quite low. But if he... W- well, even so, Australia, even though I'm saying there's more cases over on the East Coast still compared to the rest of the world, yeah. it's it's really pretty decent here. It's, for, sure. for sure. The government have done a pretty good job, to be honest. I know they get quite a bit of criticism from Australians but compared to like what's going on in America or Europe or even what was going on in China I think they've they've kept it pretty under control yeah here. yeah thankfully they have no one was prepared for this so you know criticism for for general stupidity aside you know no one's done a perfect job of of dealing with us because come on it's a totally extraordinary situation mm. so, anyway well, is there any th- any other topics you wanted to discuss um, that that I for- that I haven't mentioned or that you you felt like discussing? Um, I kind of feel like we could keep going all night, but uh, well, we could do another one. Think... We can follow this up in the future with another one. Yeah, that that might be a good idea. I I also quite I also was wanting to interview you because I've been thinking now that I can't travel. Yeah. Um, to do the series, I was thinking about trying to do some yeah, do it. Uh, do it. interviews with with English speaking people like you and a few other friends. So we could continue the conversation there as well. For sure, we'll do that. Well, um, all right. Well, I'll get um, whatever relevant links that you want included for the show notes and whatever, and I'll put them in so guys uh, know how to how to people get in contact with you or look at some of your work and. Um, and if, is there anything you wanted to say as a last message? Um, 
<laughs> I, I, I don't, can't think of anything yeah, okay. really. Well, then we'll we'll just let people take a look at your work on your various platforms, and uh, we'll continue this discussion when 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 the roles are reversed and you interview me. Yeah, yeah. So thanks a lot for taking the time to interview me. It was really, really, uh, we really had a good chat. It was really insightful. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it very much. Mm-hmm.